Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we have our weekly look at the trends, numbers, and latest news about COVID-19 with AMA's Chief Health and Science Officer, Dr. Mira Irons in Chicago. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer, also in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Irons, uh, looks like we might see some trends uh, going the wrong way this week. Can you talk to us about what the latest numbers are and trends in COVID-19? Oh, yes, Todd, I'm, I'm beginning to worry that, you know, we've, we've been here before. Um, so the current numbers are 30,706,676 individuals have been confirmed to have COVID-19 and 555,002 individuals have died of it. Um, you know, overall, case rates had bottomed out at about 55,000 cases and 1,500 deaths per day in mid-March. Remember, we talked about the fact that those numbers were still too high. Um, and then some states began seeing an uptick. Um, since then, national numbers have steadily risen. Um, infections are rising as of this morning in 20 states. Um, while new virus cases, deaths, and hospitalizations are far below their January peak, over the past week, there's been an average of, 60, of over 65,000 cases per day, an increase of 19% from the average two weeks ago. Um, of particular concern is the upper Midwest and the Northeast, um, you know, and people have talked about the fact that it's still cold, you know, in those areas. Um, but Michigan is especially being um, uh, the hardest hit, really. It's adding cases at a higher rate than any other state. As of Friday, the six metropolitan areas of the country's worst outbreaks um, were in Michigan. Um, on, on the good side, um, uh, the country is averaging fewer deaths. Um, fewer than 900 newly reported deaths a day for the first time since early November. But hospitalization numbers um, had leveled off um, after a sustained decline, and the seven-day average is up 4.8% from last week. So, you know, cause, cause for some concern. So, you know, there's a question as to whether, you know, are we in a fourth surge or not? How, how do we evaluate that? You know, it, it may be too soon to tell. Um, I remember a few weeks ago, we, we were talking about the fact that that it wasn't clear why why the steep decline happened. <laughs> um, I think, you know, we're kind of at that same place with, you know, what's, what's going on now. Um, the CDC predicted last week that the number of new COVID-19 cases per week in the U.S. would remain stable or have an uncertain trend over the next four weeks and that weekly case numbers could be as high as about 700,000 even in late April. Um, experts disagree, however, um, about whether the regional spikes over the past two weeks amount to a fourth wave of the virus. Um, just as an example, on Sunday mornings Meet the Press, Dr. Michael Osterholm, an epidemiologist who's a member of the Biden administration's COVID-19 advisory board and who I know you've had on the COVID update before, predicted that the next two weeks will bring the highest number of cases reported globally since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, but on that's, incre that's an incredible statement, uh, too, when you think about those levels, um, yeah. you know, compared with some of the optimism that we have going on here, it really says to folks, mm -hmm. we are not out of this. Be more that's careful. So, yeah. Absolutely. Um, but, you know, on Face the Nation, Dr. Scott Gottlieb, former head of the FDA and who's now on the board of Pfizer, said he didn't foresee a fourth wave and instead explained the spikes as pockets of infection around the country, particularly in younger people who haven't been vaccinated and in school aged children. So, you know, it's really unclear. Um, you know, I, I remember a statement that Dr. Holsterholm made, I believe, on one of the JAMA podcasts really early in the pandemic, where he described this virus as like um, identifying any small spark <laughs> that that it can see um, and it kind of takes hold um, and um, increases in numbers and, and perhaps that's what we're seeing now and the hope is that those communities um, will will take hold of that and try to control it well you mentioned you know uh, the uh, younger population uh, obviously unvaccinated uh, uh, to a great extent at this point you know what other kinds of trends or drivers are we seeing right now well, you know, coming off of Easter and Passover, um, also many spring breaks, we'll need to wait to see if, if those have widespread implications. You know, you usually, a week or two, you have to wait for the first infections and then hospitalizations um, and deaths four to six weeks later. You know, scientists view Florida, 
the state for the along and lifting restrictions, reopening society and welcoming tourists as a bellwether for the nation. If recent trends there are any indication, the rest of the country might be in trouble. The number of confirmed coronavirus cases in Florida has been steadily rising, though hospitalizations and deaths are still down. Um, variants continue to be an issue both in Florida and across the states. They are spreading, carrying mutations that make up the coronavirus both more contagious and in some cases more deadly. And new variants continue to pop up. California one week, New York and Oregon the next. And that B117 variant that we first saw in the uh, UK has been you know, a real driver across Europe. We're seeing kind of lockdowns go back into place there. You know, what else are you seeing, uh, you know, even globally around the variants? Yeah, you know, I think that, you know, when we think back uh, a month or two ago, um, when the discussion was that uh, the B117 variant taking hold in, in Europe, uh, the concern was that it was going to take hold in the United States. Um, and we're starting to see that it's now spreading quickly across the US. It's currently um, has been found in 51 jurisdictions in the US where testing has been um, available. The highest penetration proportionately to population has been in Michigan, Florida, Colorado, California and Massachusetts, obviously non-contiguous states. Um, so we know that that it has taken hold across the country. Um, you know, according to the most recent estimates, it's thought to be about 60% more contagious and 67% more deadly than the original form of the virus. Um, and they're finding that the variant is no different from the original in how it spreads, but infected people seem to carry more of the virus and for longer. And, you know, what that means is that it's really important um, and concerning for a respiratory virus. You know, we've talked about this. It's a respiratory virus and the, it's and if people are carrying larger um larger amounts of the virus, there's the potential of spreading more viral particles for a longer period of time. Um, so masks and social distancing become even more important. So, uh, you know, on the other side of this, some more positive news uh, on the vaccine front, which, you know, first of all, is just the pace of vaccinations. I saw over the weekend that we had a new high of four over four million doses in one day, which is really great. You know, in terms of uh, vaccine distribution, any other kind of key points to take a look at this week? You know, I think that um, the um, states are beginning to ramp up. Um, you know, as you said, Saturday marked the first time the country reported over 4 million COVID-19 doses, bringing the daily average to more than 3 million people. Um, the milestones reflect a steady increase in the capacity of states to deliver shots into arms. Um, the CDC on Sunday said about 106.2 million people have received at least one dose, including about 61.4 million people who have been fully vaccinated, either by the Johnson & Johnson single-dose vaccine or the two-dose series made by Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna. thing to remember, though, is that's only only 18.5% of the population. A lot of people, states are ramping up, but um, that's nowhere near um, where we need to be um, for herd immunity. So those public health, those public health measures are, are really important. Absolutely. So in addition to obviously continuing with that rollout and getting the numbers up, the other good news that came from Pfizer last week is about uh, effectiveness. Uh, can you talk about that research that uh, uh, was announced last week? So Pfizer um, uh, announced, uh, released news last week about its clinical trial in children, um, vaccinated children that are ages 12 to 15. Um, they, um, they found no symptomatic infections among the vaccinated children. There were no serious side effects. Now, once again, you know, that was a, a press release from the manufacturer. The data hasn't yet been reviewed by independent expert. It was data from a phase three study of 2,260 children. Um, it was 100% uh, efficacy preventing symptomatic disease. Um, the, the numbers are that uh, 18 uh, individuals in the placebo group had symptomatic disease and none in the vaccinated group. Um, they saw a robust antibody response and they um, saw that the uh, vaccine was well tolerated. Um, the side effects were consistent with that seen in the 16 to 25 year 
um, group, and um, they reported their plan to submit this data as an amendment to uh, to the FDA EUA in the coming weeks. So um, we'll we'll keep an eye out um, for that data and for the discussions. And we'll have uh, additional information from Dr. James Campbell, who's been a guest on the COVID update uh, before. Uh, for, from his perspective uh, yes. regarding this news. Um, so uh, other news includes updated uh, guidance from the CDC about travel. Can you talk about what those changes mean? Yeah, so this is really a change in guidance that people have been waiting for. You know, basically the CDC updated its guidance for people who are fully vaccinated. Now remember, fully vaccinated is two weeks after either the J&J single dose or the Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna two dose regimen. Um, fully vaccinated people officially can now travel within the U.S. without testing and skip quarantine, and that's considered um, to be low risk. To be super clear here, the CDC is not saying please travel. Um, it's saying that it's safer to do so if you've gotten your shots. Um, you know, before the blanket guidance was please don't travel unless it's absolutely essential. And if you do test and quarantine, um, now vaccinated people can skip those particu particular steps now, though they still have to wear masks, avoid crowds, and socially distance as much as they can. Well, that is good news. Well, finally, any other key messages from the AMA uh, that you want people to hear this week? Yep, um, several. On April 1st, the AMA applauded the Biden administration's agenda to tackle overdoses and substance use disorder. The agenda included increasing access to evidence-based treatment for patients with substance use disorders, with particular emphasis on removing unnecessary barriers to prescribing buprenorphine, enforcing mental health and substance use parity, advancing racial equity, and enhancing harm reduction efforts. AMA also strongly encouraged continuing telehealth flexibilities made available during the COVID-19 pandemic for patients being treated for substance use disorder. While the pandemic may not seem directly related to these efforts, the toll of substance use disorders and overdoses has actually increased during the pandemic, with 88,000 people dying of an overdose in the 12-month period ending in August 2020. Well, thank you so much for that update. Uh, Dr. Irons, as usual, it's great to have you here. I appreciate your perspective. We'll see you in, uh, next week with another update. We'll be back tomorrow. For resources on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for joining us. Please take care.